Hey everybody, you're watching a physio named Jonah. That's this guy. Where in today's video, I want to take a look at some commonly held pain myths out there from the perspective of a physiotherapist. Now, I would like to have one of those detective hats and a magnifying glass for the video, but since we don't, we're gonna use this toque and this drinking glass. Let's get myth busted. Myth busted, you are the best young boy who's a good boy. How's that, uh, how's that exercise going? Yeah, pretty good. Feels nice. Oh, uh, you'd say there's uh, no pain then? Is that right? You'd say there's no pain? No. No pain. Then guess what? No gains, bro! <laughs> Don't you know we have a Diet Coke? You have a fresh out. Yeah, this one rides a fine line for sure. There are some situations where this could be used effectively. If we picture that miracle on ice moment where they had to skate a bunch and it was a really intense, painful workout, they needed that pain of the moment in order to get the one guy to say, United States of America. That was the game. But is this true all the time? Well, I mean, I guess, no. There are 100% situations where pain does not equal gain or where the absence of pain does not mean we're not getting anywhere. I bring this up because as a physiotherapist, I spend pretty much every day working with people who are in pain. And pain actually has an interesting role in recovery as well as what brings people to the clinic. There are some techniques that physiotherapists use like needling, manual muscle releases, or joint mobilizations that may be painful. And yes, the goal of these is obviously to get better or to have a gain. But there are also techniques we use which don't have any pain associated, which are also moving towards the same goal. If we think about exercises, for example, we don't want exercises that we have somebody to do to be incredibly painful. There may be some muscle soreness or fatigue that goes along with them, but in general, we're not looking to create pain. And just because we're not creating pain doesn't mean we're not making any gains either. The key here then is that while pain may be associated with gain or improvement, it is not integral to it. There does not have to be pain in order for there to be gain. That's all, gentlemen. Hey, uh, what's going on here, sir? I saw you over by the shoes. Did you eat my laces? Well, I saw you over by the shoes and I know you could eat my laces. That's the point. Well, I know I could go check, but... So, what you're saying is I'm jumping to a conclusion that, while plausible, isn't necessarily true based on the fact that I only have one piece of evidence. You're the one convincing cavapoo. This one's gonna be pretty quick because I will be expanding upon this point later on. Yeah, no. Go ahead, pinch yourself. Does it hurt? Probably. Are we doing any damage? Yeah, probably not. Our body's nervous system is capable of sensing pain such that we can hopefully react before anything becomes damaged. Example two, it's winter here in Canada. The cold hurts, but just because my face hurts from the cold outside does not necessarily mean that I'm going to have frostbite and long-term skin damage. Quick examples like those two show that pain does not always equal damage. If we go back to exercise for a second, just because you're exercising and things become uncomfortable, again, does not mean that things are being damaged. The goal of exercise is to build up the body. Oh my god, dude, that was a crazy fall. Did it hurt? <laughs> what I mean, what can you expect? I'm older than you. I mean, I'm pretty sure that would have hurt if I fell too, but like, how old are you? I'm old enough, and boy, with pain this bad, I do not recommend getting older. Pretty sure that's a darker implication than you intended it to be. As we age, there are absolutely normal degenerative changes that occur with aging and that we expect. The distinction that I want to draw here is that just because pain can be more common as we age does not mean that you have to be in pain because you are aging. Think of the extremes with this. This would mean that every 70 year old is in more pain than every 20 year old. Let me inform you from clinical practice that this is not the case. There are some incredibly functional, low pain 70 year olds I've worked with and some 20 year olds who are in a lot of discomfort. I bring this up because there are some fairly negative stereotypes out there regarding pain, exercise, and overall physical function. If we believe that pain is always associated with aging, it may make people less likely to engage in exercise because they want to minimize the total amount of discomfort they may be in. It can create this sense of why should I bother if pain and dysfunction are going to always be associated with aging. 
but you absolutely should bother. Regardless of age, there are almost always ways to mitigate any increases in pain and help restore function. Summing this one up here, is degeneration of the joints and the body as a whole a normal process that occurs with aging? Yes, this is part of the reason that we don't live forever. But does that always correlate with pain and dysfunction? Not necessarily, and the extent to which it does is very variable between individuals. Hey, uh, how's that coffee coming, buddy? Terrible. It's not working. It's definitely broken. I think we need a new one. I want surgery. Okay, ease up. Let's keep it a little more subtextual than that. It could be broken, but like, is it plugged in? Still want a new one put in. Just because there's pain in one area of the body does not mean that there is necessarily structural or long-term damage there. Pain as a symptom can arise from a lot of different sources, and the process of pain is a lot more complicated than just your engine light turning on your car. We experience pain as a dialogue between the nerves of our body communicating with the brain and back and forth. This dialogue makes it more complicated than just a one-way engine light turning on. What I'm trying to say here is that despite what car commercials may want you to think, our bodies are more complicated than our cars. This is where things can get confusing, so let's ground it in an example. Someone has shoulder pain. They're at work, typing away, and they feel their shoulder pain. They go to lift something and notice it again. They may start to think, okay, I must have a torn rotator cuff tendon, there must be an inflamed bursa, there has to be something structurally wrong that's causing my shoulder pain, right? As you can guess based on the myth-busting tone of this entire video, there does not have to be structural damage in order for their shoulder pain to be in the shoulder. The pain could be coming from a muscle tension around that area, it could be prolonged poor positioning while they're at work, or it could be referred pain, possibly from their neck that's causing that shoulder pain. The point here is that it could be a variety of sources, none of which are a structural damage to their shoulder. I want to make it clear here though that I am not judging anyone who is worried about damage when they're in pain. I'm a physiotherapist who works with these kind of things all the time, and if I stub my toe, I'm always convinced that I tore all the ligaments in it, even though I know better. the faucet. How? Well, it's simple. There's no water coming out of the end. I checked it for blockage. There wasn't any, so now I'm gonna hit it with this hammer. You just said it wasn't blocked there. Yeah, but this is where the water comes out, so the problem has to be here. I mean, the problem doesn't have to be there, though, does it? Like, the water could be turned off, the blockage could be somewhere else in the pipe. Just because that's where the water comes out doesn't mean that's where the problem is. Oh, there you go, always turning everything into some kind of metaphor for an educational purpose. This is why Dad says he got kicked off the team. Wait, are we brothers in these sketches? Well, I mean, it'd be the same dad either way, wouldn't it? No, 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 no. Pain in one part of the body does not always mean that's where the problem or root source of that pain is. It's very common to think that something hurts here, so the problem must be here, right? There are a few problems with this myth. First off, the existence of referred pain. I touched on this in my video about muscular trigger points. The idea of referred pain is that it is a pain you experience in one area of your body that has its cause in another. I mean, this kind of debunks the whole theory on its own, so I guess let's just move on. Then we have nerve pain like a sciatica. With sciatica, pain can shoot all the way down the back of the legs, but the problem is quite often in the hip or the lower back. Yet another example where where the pain is experienced does not always mean that's where the problem is. Finally, let's use the example of hypermobility in the spine. Hypermobility is when an area moves a lot, hypermobility. Now this may cause one segment of the back to become painful because it's moving more than the segments around it. But this may be happening because one of those segments around it isn't moving as much as it should, which causes this one to become painful. The pain may be coming from the bone or joint that's moving more, 
but it isn't really their fault. The problem is coming from elsewhere. Let's use an analogy that I stole from my wonderful partner and genius physio, Nicole. We're going to think about a rowboat. Now, if two people are in a rowboat and one of them stops rowing, it's going to make it a lot harder on the other person in that rowboat. Also, the ride's gonna suck because they're just gonna go in circles. Who's gonna be the unhappy one in this scenario? The person who's rowing harder. But it isn't their fault. It's the fault of the other person who stopped rowing. Does this make sense then? The person who stopped rowing is the segment that's not moving, and the person who has to row harder is the segment that's moving too much. It's the fault of the person who stopped rowing, but the symptoms end up coming from the person who has to keep rowing. Everybody thank Nicole in the comments section for her awesome analogy. Wow, these President's Choice crisp and thin whole grain crackers sure are delicious. I know, even I like them, and I have like such a high flavor tolerance. <laughs> yeah, I know. What? Like, I mean, I've had bowls of chili that other people thought were really good, but my flavor tolerance is just too high, so like, I didn't think they were that good. Wait, do you taste things more than me or less than me then? Yep, you'll just never understand olives the same way I will. Two people who are exposed to the same external event or stimulus will experience it differently from one another. This is because they experience that event through their own internal nervous system. This involves complicated processing through the brain which changes that external stimulus and turns it into an internal one unique to each person. I think this phrase or myth gets used a lot to contextualize or qualify the pain that someone is going through. If one person has a 5 out of 10 pain with a high pain threshold and another has a 5 out of 10 pain with a low pain threshold, then the situation must be more severe for the person with the high pain threshold despite their pain levels being the same. This myth is very difficult to disprove or even really comment on honestly. Because we're all so unique in our pain experiences, it makes it very difficult to compare one person's pain tolerance to another because of how different that pain is when we experience it internally. And eventually this just ends up getting used as people comparing external stimuluses and how much it affects them. But that doesn't actually compare to how much pain they're experiencing. But I mean, I don't know. Maybe the reason I want to think this is because on this imaginary sliding scale from high to low pain threshold, mm. I'm definitely on the lower end. If you guys made it this far into the video, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate your interest in the channel and the videos that I'm making. If you have any questions or thoughts about the video, go ahead and drop them in the comments section below for me. Also consider subscribing if you'd like notifications on when I release future videos. But most importantly everybody, move your body, have a laugh today, and I will see you at the next video. Did the whole thing without the mic on.